Habakkuk chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. The pronouncement that the prophet Habakkuk saw. How long, Lord, must I call for help and you do not listen or cry out to you about violence and you do not save? Why do you force me to look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Oppression and violence are right in front of me. Strife is ongoing and conflict escalates. This is why the law is ineffective and justice never emerges. For the wicked restrict the righteous, therefore justice comes out perverted. This is the word of the Lord. I want to begin by reading to you two quotes taken from two leading members of the Anglican Church of Australia and a series of articles put out by the Standing Committee of the General Synod of the Anglican Church of Australia. That's a mouthful, isn't it? Uh, Really just the governing body while Synod isn't meeting. Uh, Matthew Anstey wrote the following quote. Matthew is an ordained Anglican minister. He's an associate professor of theology and he attends the cathedral in Adelaide. Listen carefully. There are a number of big words. Let me be clear about my view from the outset. Scripture shows us how the people of God come to make moral and theological judgments rather than providing the substantive content of those judgments. To be faithful to Scripture in this debate does not mean we exegete from Scripture and apply to lived human experience some timeless precept, but rather we seek to make our case for the doctrinal position we are arguing in dialogue with both Scripture and lived human experience. I propose, furthermore, that such an approach accords with the scriptures themselves. Matthew is saying that the Bible is not the word of God. Matthew is saying that you do not go to the Bible to find out what God thinks and, heaven forbid, trying to apply it to your lives. Matthew says that the word of God is equal to my lived human experience And when I chat to these two, I'll work out what God is thinking. Matthew is wrong. On Good Friday at the Grafton Cathedral in 2019, the Dean of the Cathedral, Gregory Jenks, an adjunct senior lecturer in theology with a PhD in theology from the University of Queensland, preached a sermon with this purpose and content. Quote, So today I want to talk briefly concerning three really bad ideas that people have about the crucifixion. First, the cross is not about divine wrath or sacred violence. It was violent, but God was the victim of the violence, not the perpetrator. How could we ever get it so wrong? Second, the simple fact is that the suffering experienced by Jesus was neither remarkable nor unique. Many people have suffered as badly as Jesus did. Third, this is the idea that my sins or yours or both yours and mine together are what caused Jesus to die. This is an idea that is especially common in Christian hymns. It is nonsense. We know what caused Jesus to be crucified and it was not your sins or my sins or the sins of anyone else we know. All such twisted theology does is create guilt. It makes us feel bad, encourages us to be compliant participants in a church forgiveness racket. It is misdirected. Jesus was killed because the powerful elites of his day wanted to eliminate him since he was a serious threat to their power and privilege. Habakkuk would have looked at men like these leading the people of God and cried out, How long, O Lord? Why, O Lord? The law has been rendered powerless by the wicked. Let me pray. Dear God, thanks for your word. Thank you that we don't dialogue with it, but we listen to it and obey it. Father, thank you for your word, that in it you reveal your eternal will, design and commitment to a world created perfect and now broken by sin. Father, thank you for your word. 
that in it alone we find out what life is, that true life is given to us in your mercy and grace by the life, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Father, this morning, help us to listen to your word, apply it by your spirit and obey it and proclaim your goodness to this town. Amen. Look at verse 1 with me. We're on page 834, Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 1, the pronouncement that the prophet Habakkuk saw. Let me introduce you to Habakkuk. I'm at point two on the outline. Uh, We know his name, Habakkuk, and that's all we know about him. He's not mentioned anywhere else in the Bible. Uh, We're not given a family history. We're not given any more than his job description. Did you see it there in verse 1? He's a prophet. We've looked at the prophets as we've looked at God's big picture. They're God's messengers. They're forth tellers. They proclaim God's word to God's people so that God's people come back to the relationship they have with God. And notice that he's been given a pronouncement. I think that's a fairly vanilla translation. Uh, It's more like a prophecy, an oracle, a burden, a revelation. Habakkuk's not made this up. God has spoken into this world and said to Habakkuk, hey, Habakkuk, I've got something you've got to speak. Go and tell it. It's a burden for you. It needs to be communicated. That's all we have about Habakkuk. What happens next is a series of questions. Well, two questions. Habakkuk's got an issue. He raises it with God. God responds. That creates another issue for Habakkuk and Habakkuk raises that issue with God and God responds. And then in chapter 3, we've got Habakkuk change. That's the book. Question, answer, question, answer, change. And the whole book is the pronouncement. He wants us to hear everything about this personal conversation with God. And if you look at your little preaching postcards, you'll see that there's a movement in Habakkuk. Uh, Three W's, why, to waiting, to worship. I don't think I'm a genius for coming up with that. I've just borrowed it from Jonathan Lamb and he put together a terrific little book with that title on Habakkuk. Why, to waiting, to worship. Habakkuk's got some questions. I'm at point three on the outline. Look at verse two. How long, Lord, must I call for help and you do not listen or cry out to you about violence and you do not save? Why do you force me to look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Two questions. But first, do you notice who Habakkuk's talking to? Who's he talking to in verse two? Lord. See it in capitals? Uh, It's an attempt to translate the personal name of God, Yahweh, the God who has said, I'm committed to this broken world. I'm committed through a certain promise, through a certain family, to do something about the world. So it's not Habakkuk standing on some distant hill shaking his fists at the universe. He's not talking to some airy-fairy sky daddy who won't talk back. He's not just venting his emotions. He's talking to Yahweh, the personal God who's committed to the broken world. They're personal questions. They're sad questions. They're questions that emerge out of his everyday life. And the first is there in verse 2. How long, Lord? You know when you're talking to someone and they just don't seem to listen to you? You mightn't have that experience. I have it a little bit. And you're talking and you just raise your voice and you raise it and you raise it. I'm not going to raise it now, but you you know what I'm talking about. That's Habakkuk. He has been talking to the Lord for a long time. Not just talking, but lamenting, crying out, saddened. And the Lord doesn't seem to hear. Perhaps he can't hear. Perhaps he just doesn't want to hear. But Habakkuk needs help. Did you see that there in verse 2? Habakkuk is surrounded by violence. And God says nothing. The second question is there in verse 3. Why? Habakkuk's perplexed. He's dismayed. It seems that the Lord is tolerating wrongdoing. 
It seems that he's making godly men like Habakkuk look at injustice. How could God do that? How could the Lord make his people look at injustice? Why is he doing that? The scene in front of Habakkuk is pretty ugly. Look at verse 3. Oppression and violence are right in front of me. Strife is ongoing and conflict escalates. It is a completely dysfunctional society. It is broken. It's an image of a damaged and damaging community. And Habakkuk laments its existence, its prolonged influence, and the fact that its future just seems to go on in depression. How long, O Lord, and why? Does that sound familiar? I'd be surprised if people in this building have not uttered those questions at least in the last few years. Perhaps in the last few months, probably in the last few hours as we gaze at the world around us. But I want us to notice the key issue for Habakkuk in verse 4. I'm at point 4 on the outline. This is why the law is ineffective and justice never emerges. For the wicked restrict the righteous and therefore justice comes out perverted. Did you catch what Habakkuk has just said? Just look at verse 4 carefully with me. The law is ineffective. Justice is perverted. Why? For the wicked restrict the righteous. Now, if you've paid attention, that is not what you'd expect. Habakkuk is not lamenting the world outside this building. Habakkuk is looking at the hearts of the people of God and saying, you are fundamentally dysfunctional. You are broken. You are damaging and damaged. Habakkuk's concern is not about what he saw in a current affair last night. It's not about what he read in the Sydney Morning Herald or the Daily Telegraph. Habakkuk's concern is what he's seen as the people of God hang out together. The wicked are those who say, I'm part of God's people, but who fundamentally disobey God because the law is not the speed limit, it's not the tax law, it's not do not litter, it's the revelation that God has given his people so that they can show him to the world. And Habakkuk looks at the people of God and says, you are broken. You are dysfunctional. Now we need to go on a bit of a cook's tour of the Old Testament to understand the depth of his lament. So turn with me to Genesis 12, 1 to 3. That's page 9 in your pew Bibles. Page 9 in your pew Bibles. Adam and Eve have decided they know better than God. They've decided that God isn't for them, that they could be better than God. They rejected God and his clear word to them. We've learned about that lately, haven't we? The perished kingdom. The attitude they've expressed is called sin. It's the attitude and action that says, I'm God and God's not. You'll get sick of this. It has I in the middle. We need to keep remembering that. God is offended by sin. God judges sin. All humans are under that judgment because we're all connected to Adam and Eve and we bear that problem in our hearts, in our very being. We're all under the judgment of death. The whole world is dysfunctional and God commits to that world. Genesis 12, verse 1, The Lord said to Abram, Go out from your land, your relatives, your father's house, to the land that I'll show you. I'll make you into a great nation. I'll bless you. I'll make your name great and you'll be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you. I'll curse anyone who treats you with contempt. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Did you catch God's mercy there? Did you catch that in that last verse, God said that through this family, I will roll back the curse of sin across the whole world. God has committed through Abraham's family 
to deal with sin. We've learned about that lately, haven't we? Now, there's nothing to recommend Abraham. Put simply, he's a 75-year-old idol-worshipping nomad who has a barren wife. He doesn't tick any boxes. God takes the initiative. God makes the decision. God is committed. It's God's justice and love that drives the roll back the curse commitment. And when you follow Abraham's family, and we're going to do that a little later in the year, through the twists and turns as it passes to Isaac and to Jacob and then the 12 boys who navigate sibling rivalry and drought and slavery, right throughout there, there's this whopping great big signpost saying, I will deal with the sin of the world through Abraham's family. God saves them and brings them to meet with him. At Mount Sinai, after God has saved them, he meets with them. After God has, you're getting the chronology, aren't you? After God has rescued them, he meets with them. Page 63, Exodus 19, 1 to 8. And when he meets with them, he gives them a job. Exodus chapter 19, verse 3. Moses went up the mountain to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain. This is what you must say to the house of Jacob and explain to the Israelites. You've seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you will listen carefully to me and keep my covenant, you'll be my own possession out of all the peoples, although the whole earth is mine, and you'll be my kingdom of priests, my holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. Did you catch the job? You ought to be my priests. You ought to represent me to the world. Now, if you think about it, that's what humans have always done, isn't it? God made Adam and Eve to rule the world under him. They represented God to the world. They decided they didn't want to do that. God's given the job to Abraham's family. He's gathered them together and said, here is your job. So to do that job, they've got to know him. They've got to know him well. You can't represent someone if you don't know them. And so the next chapter, Exodus 20, is the Ten Commandments. And in the law, the Ten Commandments, and the next two books, Leviticus and Numbers, God gives them a revelation of his character in the form of some commands. Look at Exodus 20, verses 1 and 2. Then God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the place of slavery. If that's who I am, this is how you represent me. If you obey these commands, the world will see what I am like and they will come back to me. You will reveal me to the world. That's your job. And if you look at Exodus 19 verse 8, how do God's people respond? We will do all that the Lord has spoken. We're in it, boots and all. God's committed to roll back the broken state of the world through Abraham's family. God has committed to them, rescued them, and given them one job, represent God to the world. God has then given them his revelation so that in obeying the law, they'll represent God to the world and the world will know who God is. You see why Habakkuk is so sad? You see why Habakkuk cries out for so long? Do you see why Habakkuk is so concerned? The very tool that God has committed to save the world through is broken. They do not represent God to the world. They do not show God faithfully to the world. They're so damaged by willful sin and wickedness that the law is ineffective. They're not representing God to the world. So the key question is this. If the tool's broken, where's the hope of the world? How will sin be rolled back? How will the curse be broken? Now let me tell you, that's not an airy-fairy concern, is it? That's not a false alarm. 
when we understand what is going on in front of Habakkuk, we can see how real his lament is. Now, I want us to notice that in those first four verses, we're given no time or geography markers, are we, in Habakkuk 1? Oh, we're given a couple. Uh, It's sometime after the law, so it's after Mount Sinai. That's helpful, isn't it? We know he's a prophet, so we know that it's sometime after they're in that nation of Israel, that geography on the Mediterranean. But I think the lack of time markers and geography is important in those first four verses because this has always been the problem for the people of God. This has always been the problem for the people of God, that they do not represent God faithfully to the world because their wicked sin chokes them at their job. It was the case in Abraham's day. It's the case today. We give in our first marker, and I'm not going to steal too much of Neil's sermon from next week. We give in our first marker in verses 5 and 6. Look there in Habakkuk 1. Look at the nations and observe. Be utterly astounded. For I'm doing something in your days that you will not believe when you hear about it. Look, I'm raising up the Chaldeans, Babylonians, that bitter and impetuous nation that marches across the earth's open spaces to seize territories not its own. Did you notice the time marker? The Chaldeans, the Babylonians. We can now place it somewhere in history on that map of God's big picture unfolding. They rose as a political power around 610 to 605 BC. Up until that point, Assyria had been the regional superpower. God's people, if you remember from God's big picture, had divided. After the death of Solomon, the northern kingdom emerged and there were ten tribes. Its capital was in Samaria. It was initially ruled by a former public servant, Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. He's a very astute political operator. He's sick of his people going over the border and putting their temple taxes into the coffers of the south. So he creates an alternative way to access God. He sets up two shrines in the north with golden calves and we know how good they are to access God, don't we? God warned his people in the north. He sent prophets. They were not representing him faithfully to the world. God warned his people in the north. He sent prophets. Do you remember Johnny and his mum and those new pair of shoes and the puddles? God was more patient than that. And patient and patient and patient. And then in the ninth year of Hoshea, the king of Assyria captured Samaria. He deported the Israelites to Assyria and settled them in Halah along the Habor, Gozans River, in the city of the Medes. This disaster happened because the people of Israel sinned against the Lord their God who brought them out of the land of Egypt from the power of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and because they worshipped other gods. Do you see the echo of Exodus 19? They hadn't represented God. And so God wiped them out. Assyria was replaced by Babylon around 605 B.C., So Habakkuk is around that time. He can't be working in the north because they don't exist anymore. He's working in the south. He's working in Judah and Jerusalem. He's around about the time of the rule of King Josiah. Josiah is a wonderful man. Josiah brings God's people back to their job. He recommits them to the job of representing God to the world. Josiah dies and with him and his leadership dies the commitment to God. He's replaced by his sons. The second son is King Jehoiakim. Listen to how he's described in Jeremiah 22. Jeremiah is a peer of Habakkuk. Woe for the one who builds his palace through unrighteousness, his upstairs rooms through injustice, who makes his neighbour serve without pay and will not give him his wages, who says... I'll build myself a massive palace with spacious upstairs rooms. He'll cut windows in it. It'll be panelled with cedar, paint it bright red. Are you a king because you excel in cedar? Didn't your father eat and drink and administer justice and righteousness? It went well with him. He took up the case of the poor and needy, then it went well. Is this not what it means to know me? This is the Lord's declaration. 
but you have eyes and a heart for nothing except your own dishonest profit, shedding innocent blood, committing extortion and oppression. That is the society in front of Habakkuk, a society of economic injustice, exploitation, violence, conflict, selfishness, corruption. The people of God are rotten from the head to the heart to the feet. They are no different to anyone else. And Habakkuk cries out, How long, O Lord? Why, O Lord? Where is the hope of the world to be found? Who will show the world the Lord if God's people are so broken, dysfunctional and wicked? Whatever else Habakkuk is doing, he's lamenting sin, isn't he? And that point five on the outline. If you take nothing else away from this morning, please take away this. Sin is serious. Sin is serious. I suspect that's another reason why there are no markers of time and geography in verses 1 to 4. Because sin is serious always. There is no time more or less sinful than another. One sin makes it all sinful. Sin out there, sin in here, sin is serious. Please do not miss that. We are all sinners by virtue of our humanity. And because of that, we have a serious problem. But we must also not miss where Habakkuk is lamenting sin. He's lamenting sin in the people of God. It has crippled them. It has broken them. It has removed their ability to be distinctive from the world around them so that the world meets God. Now, let me be clear. God's people will always struggle with sin. God knows that. God knows that between now and when Jesus returns, we will fight against sin. Remember Ephesians chapter 6? But he is talking here about the willful attitude that downplays sin, that nurtures certain special sins, that ignores the seriousness of sin, that willingly and willfully indulges in sin, that hears regularly the very word of God and says, I hear you, God, but... And in that case, Habakkuk is right, isn't he? Where is the hope of the world if here, even here, People do not meet God. That's why those quotes at the start are so disturbing, are they? The quotes from Matthew and Gregory. These are men who are leading God's people, who are proclaiming heresy, who are saying the word of God is not the word of God and Jesus didn't die for your sins. That's appalling. The job of the people of God has not changed whatever label they meet under. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 to 10, For you are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness. That's our job. What are those men doing? Why are they doing it? Why don't they take sin seriously? Why are they so willful in standing with their Bibles open and proclaiming falsehood? Let me tell you, this last week our bishop has had the pleasure of the bishop's conference. He has spent a week with men like that who have beaten him from pillar to post because he says Jesus Christ died for our sins. Why would you do that? But let me also say that Habakkuk doesn't talk about denominations, does he? He talks about the people of God. That's us. 
And so the same questions apply to us on a local and personal level. As a local church community, one amongst many of the people of God here who meet under the Anglican label, has our wickedness, has our sin, has our willful ignoring of the clear word of God ever strangled our representation of God in this town? At a personal level, as well as a local level, do we take sin seriously? Do we confront it in our community? Do we deal with it the same way God does in merciful justice? Or do we willfully ignore the clear word of God and so strangle his representation in this town by his people? Let me encourage you to join Habakkuk in crying out. We must cry out and ask God to do something in judgment about the wicked amongst the people of God. We must do it. And so in that sense, we must also examine our own hearts and minds, mustn't we? As a community and as individuals in this town, we must confront our own sin that might have strangled the representation of God and his commitment to dealing with sin. We must ask him for forgiveness and restoration. We must ask and plead with him to do something about it. So let me finish with three very specific prayer points. First, we need to pray for those who lead our church. We need to give thanks for Rick and Janine, Jeff and Catherine and the other bishops who've held on to the truth of the gospel in a week that has been so appalling. They have been subjected to verbal bullying and social isolation because they say Jesus died for our sins. We need to give thanks to God for them, whatever our personal disagreements with them. And we need to give thanks for the opportunity at General Synod in May for us to hold on to the truth, whatever the outcome. Second, we need to give thanks for our diocese. I'm dealing with just those who meet under the Anglican label and I want to give thanks for the fact that across our diocese today, the word of God is being preached faithfully. It's being preached faithfully under other labels in our town. Don't hear me wrongly. But for our label, from Lightning Ridge to Walgett to Tenerfield, over to Walker, down to Corindi, the church is in Armadale, the church is in Tamworth, the good news of Jesus is being proclaimed. That's good. But it can be lost so quickly, can't it? And thirdly, I want us to pray for our church community here. We've got a job to do. We are to represent God in this town. To point people to what he's done in dealing with sin through the family of Abraham. We need to pray that that happens. We need to pray that he guards our steps and our hearts and our hands and our mouths and our minds from sin so it's not strangled. We need to confess quickly if we have. And we need to rejoice in delight when it goes out. So how about I pray about those things now and then if you've got any brief questions, you can ask them. Dear God, thank you that you have committed to this world. Thank you that through that solemn promise to the family of Abraham, you committed to rolling back curse and replacing it with blessing. You committed to deal with sin and bring forgiveness. Father, thank you that you do that through the family of Abraham, which ultimately comes down to one. Jesus Christ, thank you that through his life, death and resurrection you've gathered us as your people. Father, please be with our leaders that they will stand firm on the truth of your word. Father, we give you thanks for the way in which you've sustained that proclamation in this part of the world. And Father, in this town, if in our willful sin We've hidden the truth of the gospel. We ask you for forgiveness and we ask that you'll help us to represent you faithfully here.
Amen.